No one should disparage an art because maybe it does not contain all of the elements. And, and that's the lesson I learned that day from my Aikido instructor. Hello, everyone. It's episode 72 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Grandmaster John Pellegrini. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, as so many of you know already, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you checking us out again. If you're not familiar with our products, why don't you head on over to whistlekick.com and take a look at everything we make. One of our most popular gear items is our shin guards. They're double layered where it counts, shaped to wrap around your shin, and the design not only makes them more comfortable and effective, but they last longer. If you want to see the show notes, those are on a different website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Today, we get to hear from Grandmaster John Pellegrini. As the founder of Combat Hapkido, which has been called the science of self-defense, Grandmaster Pellegrini has become very much in demand as a seminar presenter. He also holds rank in Taekwondo and has received significant media attention over his career. His episode came as a suggestion from one of our listeners, and I'm so glad we reached out to him. He's an entertaining man and a passionate martial artist, Two qualities that always translate to a great episode. Don't skip over today's outro as we ended up adding a bit of our personal conversation after the show ended. So let's roll. Grandmaster Pellegrini, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Pleasure to be here. Well, the, the pleasure is mine. And I know we've got at least a few of our listeners out there that are really looking forward to this episode. We, we got actually multiple requests to get a hold of you and interview you. So, uh, I know we're going to – there's at least a few of us that are going to be happy, and I'm, I'm one of them. So, uh, But let's, let's go on. Let's start the way, as, as those that listen to the show weekly know, we always start in the same way. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, it's interesting because um, I had some interest uh, in my teenager years. Uh, I grew up – I was born and grew up in Italy. Uh, and I had a couple of friends that did judo – and uh, one of them did some karate classes uh, at the local uh, uh, college. And uh, I got interested, but uh, I did not pursue it. I, you know, I attended a few classes. I went there uh, to watch. And, but uh, I did not have the passion at that time. I never thought that I could really get into uh, the martial arts as a, as a life-changing activity. Um, then when I was 19, I was, uh, in the military and, uh, because of the, uh, special unit I was in, they were teaching a lot of hand to hand combat and being a fairly small guy, I immediately realized, uh, the benefit of learning, uh, skills and techniques that can help you against uh, a bigger opponent or someone with a weapon. And, uh, I think that's when, uh, my passion developed, and uh, after I got out of the Army um, and I moved to the United States, I started taking classes, first in karate, but then uh, because I was moving a lot, uh, I transferred to New York and I started taking Taekwondo and I got into the Korean martial arts. So that was the genesis of, of my beginning. That's great. So. What do you think changed for you in your perspective, in, your, in the way you saw the martial arts from when you were first introduced to it and you weren't interested? Because I'm, I, if, if it was simply about the combat aspects, I'm guessing it wouldn't have become such a, a big piece of your life. There must have been something else. Uh, yes. Uh, you must understand that uh, I, I spent uh, most of my life uh, in uh, law enforcement and corporate security. And uh, the self-defense aspect was always the most important part to me. It was not the sport. Um, although I enjoyed uh, uh, some competition in my early years in Taekwondo, 
Um, although I enjoy going to watch, uh, you know, martial arts shows and stuff like that and movies, um, I was always interested in the more practical uh, aspect of the arts and what they can do for the individual. And I don't mean only physically. Um, what they do by giving you the skills of self-defense, the martial arts also help you develop self-confidence, awareness, um, respect, uh, a healthy respect for danger, and understanding all the different situations that we face uh, throughout our lives. Uh, so I thought that the martial arts were also uh, character uh, forming, uh, and not like I said, not just physically. The physical aspect is important, of course, but that they also help you um, spiritually, I think, and intellectually to develop into a stronger and better person. And I think that that response probably resonates for a lot of our listeners. I mean, certainly people that listen to the show know my views on the martial arts. I love the martial arts and for all of the reasons that you just named. Yes. Now, I'm sure as someone who has been training for a while and, and you know, you've trained internationally, you know, you've, you've been around, right? You bounce around, you, you very highly regarded. I know you've got a ton of stories. But if I had to press you and say, tell us your, your absolute best one, why don't you take a second and go ahead and tell us that? <laughs> well, that one is a little bit of an ambush question <laughs> because uh, um, there has been so many, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there has been so many stories. Um, when you travel the world and uh, you're blessed uh, to, to meet so many great martial artists, you also meet a lot of jerks. And uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of wannabes, uh, a lot of fakes. Uh, I could tell you dozens of stories, but um, um, unfortunately, when you put me on a spot like this, it's very hard to come up with one. Um, all I can tell you also that some of the people that I've trained, I met, and interacted with have passed on. And they, uh, they have left really some very um, beautiful memories in my heart. And, and I can name some of the people, if you want me to, that had really Please. made a great impression. And one of them was uh, Professor Wally J. I think he was one of the greatest uh, martial artists that ever lived. And not just because of his wonderful techniques, but he was such a gentleman and, and such a, a kind uh, person. And when I met him the first time, uh, we were in, just to tell you a quick story, I was doing a different style, obviously. I was doing a hapkido, and he, he taught uh, small circle jiu-jitsu. And uh, I went to one of his seminars. We met, we, we talked, and uh, he um, was so open-minded. And I said, look, professor, I'm not going to do your style. I'm just here to steal some of your technique. And he looked at me, and he says, Thank God for that. I'm so happy. <laughs> and, and I mean, it, it was totally disarming because um, I, um, I thought that maybe he would resent the fact that I was there learning and then taking some of his material to put into my material. But instead, he, he was happy and he gave me some advice and he encouraged me to continue doing that and continue learning. So that was a great story, I think. But there is another one I think you'll find funny. Um, I decided that uh, I wanted to compare Aikido to Hapkido. Hapkido being Korean in origin, Aikido being Japanese in origin, but both founders uh, of the two systems, they, they study under Sokaku Takeda, the uh, uh, father of uh, uh, Daito Ru Aiki Jiu Jitsu. So I wanted to find out for my own education why these two men went in such different direction. Uh, Aikido is softer and has different characteristics than Hapkido. And I wanted to know what the difference is. So I decided to study Aikido. And uh, I placed myself under uh, uh, Fumio Toyoda Sensei, who passed away. He was in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, I studied under him for a few years. And finally, I tested and uh, got my black belt in Aikido. 
Uh, after the test, we went to a restaurant, and we were having pizza and a beer. And uh, he was a fire plug of a man, you know, uh, probably five foot two, but, but as hard as a rock. And a uh, great sense of humor. And I happened to open my mouth like an idiot. And during our dinner, I said to him, you know, sensei, you know, Aikido is beautiful, but it's not very practical for self-defense. It's very flowery, <clears throat> and uh, some of the movements are really unrealistic. And so I, I love the art, you know, but it's not very practical for self-defense. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you want self-defense? And I said, yes, sir. By gun. <laughs> and it really, it, it was fun in a sense, but he also taught me a lesson, a great lesson in humility, a great lesson in understanding that not every art uh, is designed uh, for the same reason. Some people, as you know, uh, join the martial arts because they love the sport aspect. They want to compete. They want to go into tournaments and championships. And some of my best friends, like uh, Bill Wallace and several others, have made their name in the, uh, in the competition circuit, in the sport aspect. Other people learn it, like me, and pursue it for self-defense because we like the reality-based aspect. We want to teach police officers and military, and uh, we believe that self-defense is the most important element. But there are other people that study for the tradition, for the beauty, for the aesthetic and, and spiritual part of the art. And they should not be discounted. So all three aspects are valid, and uh, sometimes they overlap, they, they complement each other, but uh, no one should disparage an art because maybe it does not contain all of the elements. Um, and, and that's the lesson I learned that day from my Aikido instructor. And I think that that's a great lesson, and it's one that I wish more people would learn, that there is absolutely value. Well, and I see if, I'm curious to see if you agree. My personal feeling is that all martial arts have value. If they didn't, they wouldn't exist. They would just cease to exist very quickly if no one found value in them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've written several articles with that particular uh, phrase that you just, uh, that you just said. Every martial arts is value. The only thing that we must understand, however, that they have different values for different people. So if you are six foot five and 300 pounds, uh, maybe you want, you, you, you're drawn to kickboxing or, or MMA or sumo wrestling. If you are 75 year old and 120 pounds, maybe you want to do Tai Chi. Uh, there, are, there is value in every single one of them, but it's really up to the individual and what they are looking for. Self-defense and the martial arts are not a one-size-fits-all. Otherwise, there will be only one style. You know, there is only one baseball. There are not 500 styles of baseball. Baseball is baseball. Um, and by the way, I don't follow it, so, you know, maybe there are other styles that I don't know about. Um, uh, all I'm saying is that there are so many styles of martial arts coming uh, from different cultures around the world uh, because uh, the human nature uh, is different and it tends to gravitate toward uh, something that is of interest to the individual. The individual has to find his own meaning, his own value uh, into the art. Uh, but they are all worthwhile, they are all valuable, and they all have great lessons to teach. I'm glad we agree. And you said it so much better than I did, so thank you. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't. So let's let's pretend for a minute that maybe you didn't go into the service or you didn't go into that unit where martial arts became something that you valued and you wanted to hold on to, that your only experience was as a teenager where it didn't really resonate for you. And you continued your life and you no longer are Grandmaster Pellegrini, you're Mr. Pellegrini. What do you think would have been different about your life without the martial arts? 
Um, oh my God, uh, that is, that is really good question, uh, and, and, but but it's a very profound one too because basically you're asking me to imagine what my life would have been like without the martial arts. And uh, that is a very difficult question because none of us uh, can possibly uh, think of what an alternate universe would be for us. But I'll try to, I'll try to answer it. Uh, after about 20 years of uh, career in, the, um, in law enforcement, uh, throughout, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout which I was taking classes sporadically. Sometime I would go two, three times a week. Sometime I would not go for two months, depending on my workload and everything else. Um, I start facing a little bit of a crossroad because uh, I realized all of a sudden it was like a, a revelation that I enjoy not just learning, but I was enjoying passing it along and helping teaching classes at the school that I was attending. And people start coming up to me and say, you know, you're really doing a great job. You, you, you have personality and, and you should consider teaching. I, it never crossed my mind until then. Never in the least I thought that I would one day uh, do martial arts full time and, and become a a, a fairly uh, a famous martial artist that never, never in a million year ever crossed my mind. So how my life would have been different? Uh, I would have continued with the career I was doing. I was very stressed out. I used to smoke. Uh, it, it was a very stressful job. Uh, I don't know what would have happened to me, uh, both physically, mentally, emotionally. The martial arts that totally changed my life uh, I opened up my first school while I was still working uh, in my full-time job in 1985. And after two years, I, um, I had to make a decision. Uh, it was either doing the martial arts justice or do my other career justice and, uh, because I was too stressed out to do both. And uh, after some reflection, I gave up uh, a very high-paying job uh, and uh, I quit. I just went in there and I quit and I decided to do martial arts full time. It was not an easy decision, I'll tell you. It was scary actually because of uh, the loss of income, a steady income, but I felt that I, that I had a passion and I could do this. Uh, and that was really the pivotal moment that there was uh, truly the catalyst that changed my whole life. Uh, and I worked very hard at it but uh, I became successful, and uh, it, it, it took my life in a totally different direction. Through the martial arts, I also met my wife. Uh, the martial arts totally uh, changed who I was as a person. Uh, obviously, I quit smoking. Um, I used to have a fairly hot temper, and that, that changed. I became more patient, more, more uh, uh, you know, more... Um, mature, more um, sensitive to other people, more respectful of other people, uh, less negative, much more positive. So it affected me in so many ways that, um, and I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but I have no idea what my life would have been like if I did not make the change and, and became a full-time martial artist. I, I, I have no idea what would have become of me. And that's kind of the beauty of this question, I guess. On, on the surface, this is really a terrible question because any, anyone that's been training for a long time struggles to answer it. They can't imagine what their life would be like without the martial arts. I, I, I'm, I'm the same way. You're absolutely but, right. But everyone answers that question in a different way. None of them answer it the what, what I might call the right way. <laughs> Because it's 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 nearly impossible. But your answer tells us so much about you and the way that you look at the martial arts, and that's really the goal of asking you that question is to to watch you wander through and come up with a answer. So thank you for indulging me with that. You're welcome. Now, 
let's come back to reality where you are you and you have had all of your martial arts training. And I'd like to th- you to think back over your life and tell us about a point that was particularly challenging and how your experience in the martial arts allowed you to overcome it. Uh, initially, um, like I think most people getting into the martial art, I look at this, um, the uh, physical aspect. And um, I'm 5'11", and my average weight always was around 160, 155, 160. So I've always felt that um, a bigger person uh, would always uh, have the best of me, and, and I will never be really good at the martial arts. Uh, because I felt that you had to uh, be able to punch a brick wall and jump, uh, you know, 30 feet up in the air. I was never very athletic. I was never really into sports. Um, I was not particularly coordinated. And I was uh, uh, basically a a person with a small frame. Um, And the most challenging part was... to realize that I could do it and that I would do it and, and my size would have nothing to do with it and I could overcome being a, a little bit uncoordinated, I could overcome flexibility issues, uh, I could overcome all these things and actually become very good and very coordinated and, and, and fairly athletic and be able to kick and punch and do all the things that martial artists are expected to do. So to me, the, the, the hardest part was to really uh, overcome the, um, the insecurity that I had concerning my own body and, and the things that I could do with my body. Um, you know, if you are a football player or you've been in sports all your life and uh, you're very athletic or maybe you've done gymnastic or something, um, you you go into the martial arts already, I think, with an advantage. You go in there, you know, a little more confident because you know your athletic ability. Uh, I had nothing of that, uh, of that kind. And uh, so for me, the challenge was to learn how to accept myself and realize that I could do those things and be good at it. And, and, and when I started feeling that confidence, uh, truly was life-changing. What might you recommend to someone else that maybe was starting in the martial arts and feeling some of those same sensitivities, someone smaller? I'm, I'm smaller than you are, and I can relate to what you're saying. But let's say someone was brand new, they had just put on a white belt. What might you tell them about feeling insecure in that way? Uh I use my I use myself as an example. I, I look at them and I, and, I, and I say to them, you know, you got to use a little sense of humor here, not take yourself too seriously. So I tell them, I say, look, look at me. If I could do it, you can do it. It's that simple. That's what I would tell it, and that's what I have told many people over the years. They come to me. I, I use example, real life examples. Uh, if I have a, an older woman come into uh, our organization and say, I would like to learn, but I think I'm too old. That's what we get many times. And I tell her, well, we just graduated a 73 year old lady to black belt uh, last month. Uh, we have people in wheelchair coming to us. They say, oh, I would like to do this, but I can't. I said, why can't you? So, well, my legs, okay, so don't kick. Just use your hands. You can do it. And we have people in wheelchair doing the martial arts. So regardless uh, if, if the person is young or old, skinny or fat, uh, if they have good abilities or not, everybody, everybody, and I mean this literally, virtually everybody can do the martial arts because there are so many styles and can be adapted. So, you know, you want to do Taekwondo, maybe if you are in a wheelchair, uh, maybe that's not the best art for you. But you can certainly do jujitsu. You can certainly do uh, hapkido. You can certainly do other arts. So you work around your limitation if you have any. Um, some are self-imposed limitation, and you can overcome them. Others are real. I mean, if somebody has no legs, they can't kick. So you know we cannot be hypocritical about it. 
that person should really should not do a kicking art, but they can do an art that involves a lot of hand techniques, pressure points, striking, um, joint locking. It, so, you know, the martial arts are, are open to everyone. If a, a person thinks, oh, you know, I just started, I don't know if I can do it, it's because they are imposing their own limitations. Uh, and someone like me can help sometime by uh, using a little humor and challenging them and say, listen, you know, I could do it. And I was uncoordinated. I'm a small guy. I'm a skinny guy. You can certainly do it. Don't worry about it. You know, you, you phrase it in a positive quest, in a positive manner, with, in my opinion, with a little bit of humor thrown into it. People respond very well to that. And uh, like I always say, let's not take ourselves too seriously. You know, we are all human, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we all can share into the same things, um, but not two people will do them exactly the same. You know, I will never be Bruce Lee, and, uh, you know, there was only one Bruce Lee. So <laughs> I tell that to people, too, when they start. I say, maybe you'll never be Bruce Lee or Chuck Norris, but you can still learn and have fun, and it will change your life. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said, and thank you. And I think that there's a couple motivational posters in there that people may want to break quotes out of. I, I certainly took some notes. You might see some of those on our social media, guys. Now, as you've traveled, you mentioned towards the beginning that you've had the opportunity to train with some pretty incredible people. If you had to pick out someone other than your immediate instructors, the people that, that you trained with for a real period of time, who would you say was the most influential on your martial arts? Outside of my instructor who uh, uh, is celebrating uh, his 50 years as a black belt in Korea, uh, as a matter of fact, the next year, um, He's a wonderful individual. His name is Grandmaster Inson Sale, and uh, he's uh, an incredible martial artist and incredible human being. So if I do not uh, count him in, 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 in my answer, uh, I would have to go back to someone I've already mentioned to you during the interview. I think Professor Wally J was one of the people that really um, – inspire me. Let's, let's use the word because I think it's a great word. He gave me a lot of inspiration, encouragement, and I respect him so much. Uh, but there were other two. Uh, the late uh, Professor Remy Pressas uh, was also a friend of mine and an incredible, incredible uh, human being. Uh, they were always so open-minded. And one thing that I admire, I want, you, I want you to understand that in my answer, uh, one thing that I admire is not just the technique. Somebody can be really good. Somebody can be a phenomenal technician, a phenomenal martial artist, and still be a jerk, believe it or not. Uh, these were people, however, they were phenomenal martial artists, but they were also incredibly humble, accessible, uh, and, and truly inspire people with their kindness, their friendship, their encouragement, and their generosity, because they, they freely share their uh, knowledge uh, without really asking for anything in return. Uh, amazing, amazing people. When I think about the people that we'd put you know, and, and certainly those people you named are in this group, those people at the top of the martial arts. And I've been lucky enough to meet some of them. Some of them have been on this show. They all share that quality that you're talking about, that openness, that willingness to learn and to share what they know. And I think that there's something pretty special about that. And I don't think it's an accident. No, no, uh, it's not an accident at all because uh, in, in a very modest and humble way, I want to tell you that I find myself in the same position now. Now that I spent over 40 years, that I've reached the top uh, of the hierarchy, I share my, uh, my knowledge with people freely. I, I, 
uh, attend other people's events. I, you know, I try to be as humble and accessible uh, as humanly possible because I realized that I was blessed. Uh, I, I, I was so fortunate to find myself at the right place at the right time. I was so fortunate to take the fork in the road at one time in my life that allow me now to be who I am, that all I want to do is share it with other people. All I want to do is to give something back to the community, uh, and, and I mean specifically to the martial arts community. I want to encourage other people, younger people uh, or older people for their mother, uh, to to get into the martial arts, to uh, to achieve the benefits that it has to offer. So, you know, um, these people uh, that you mentioned and that I mentioned uh, are that way because really the martial arts make us that way. They, we we feel that uh, we have been very fortunate, and it is un- incumbent upon us to share and to give something back. And I'd encourage people to roll the tape, quote unquote, tape back about 30 seconds and listen to that again, because that's a pretty powerful sentiment. Now let's talk about competition. You mentioned early on that you have some experience with martial arts competition. Yes. And Could you tell us about that? Yeah. And it was not a lot to brag about, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> I... Um, I opened up my first school in 1985, and I opened up my second school uh, in 1987. Uh, this was in Florida. And uh, basically, being initially only a taekwondo school, uh, we attended a lot of taekwondo tournaments, probably once a month minimum. And uh, I took students with me, and uh, I also competed myself. And I would love, I would love, absolutely would love to tell you how many trophies I won, how many medals, how many championships. Um, unfortunately, the sad truth is I wasn't that good. And uh, <laughs> it was never really my passion. And uh, I, I did it because it was part of the pageantry of the art. It was part, everybody in Taekwondo went to tournaments. And as a school, I had to participate. Um, I gotta tell you, deep down inside, it was never uh, a passion for me. It was never what I wanted to do, and uh, therefore I was never that good at it. I was never gifted. Uh, so, and then listen, there was another aspect to it. And uh, now I know it's going to be a little controversial what I'm going to say, but there was a lot of uh, egos, a lot of cheating at tournaments, with judging, uh, going to the to the students. Uh, the judge belonging to the same school of the students and favoring their students, a lot of back calls by referees. There was a lot of politics and a lot of, you know, games being played. And I was not impressed with the part of the art. Uh, the kids, they saw what was going on. Some of them felt cheated. They went back home and they didn't want to go back to class. They dropped out. Uh, and so there was a negative ax- aspect to the to the competition part. And uh, after several years of that, I decided basically to stop. And uh, I stopped competing, and I stopped taking my students to competition. Uh, I didn't forbid it. If any of them wanted to go on a weekend, wanted to attend a tournament, well, God bless them. I I did not encourage it. Uh, but uh, if they went, they were free to go. Uh, I just decided I did not want to be part of that uh, anymore, and uh, that was my choice. You know, we've talked a lot on this show about competition, about all of the positive aspects of it, but I'm realizing as you were talking that we really haven't talked much about the negative aspects. True. And... Because most people, Some, I'm sorry, but most people don't want to talk about, nobody wants to talk about the negatives. Everybody right. always wants to be positive, And I understand that. But, you know, there is a dark side. There is a negative side uh, to the competition. And, and I think also that exists in the, in the big ones like the uh, UFC and the MMA. And I think there is a dark side to it. And, you know, honest people need to address 
I agree. I agree. And without digging too much into the specifics of, of what you're talking about, because we don't want to offend anyone in particular, no, no. but there's one piece that I do want to pull out that I had never considered, and that's how an unpleasant competition experience for someone, especially a younger rank or a younger student, can actually pull them out of the martial arts. It can be so negative that they choose to leave. You are so right. And I'll tell you for personal experience, okay, this is not fanciful. This is not making it up. This is personal experience. If I would take 20 students, mostly youngsters, by the way, to a tournament on a Saturday, the Monday in class, three or four will never show up again. This happened, this happened every single tournament I went to. Even if we brought back several trophies, some kids will be super excited and happy because those are the ones that won. The one that didn't win or felt cheated by the decisions of the judges, they got so bitter about it, so disappointed, that some of them, not all of them, but some of them never came back to class. What a terrible loss. Right. So if I could bounce this off of you, it, it, it might sound like you would say there's a minimum standard for quality, for maintaining that the judges are objective for making sure everyone, obviously everyone can't win, but everyone can have a positive experience that you would say that if, if an event is not going to maintain that level of integrity, that we're actually doing our entire industry a disservice. That's because we're simply human. And, you know, just because somebody's a judge uh, in a tournament, that doesn't take the person and transform them into a super objective and fair human being all of a sudden. We all have our own passions, our likes and dislikes, our preference, and uh, it's not easy to maintain the level of fairness. And, and I, I don't know if it could ever be achieved. That happens, by the way, outside of the martial arts too. Uh, looking in the legal system, you know, the fairness of the legal system. Sometimes the guilty goes free and sometimes the innocent gets convicted in a court of law. Uh, so we cannot expect people judging, you know, a, 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 the, a, the forms of a tournament to be totally unbiased. Maybe they don't like the form. Maybe they don't like the uniform the kid is wearing. Maybe they don't like uh, the haircut. Uh, you know, things happen. We're human. And, and that's why, you know, I don't. Uh, I have nothing against competition. If people like it, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I just chose not to be part of it anymore. I, I shifted the focus of our schools and, and uh, our students in a different direction. So I don't want to be critical of other people doing it. And, and there are certainly some great positive aspects to competition, too. Um, I'm just saying that it was not really the directions that I wanted to go. And you're not the only one. We've had guests on the show who have, you know, they they entered one event at, as a child and realized very quickly, this is not for me. And one of the things I love about the martial arts is not only are there so many different styles of martial arts, but there are so many different ways to engage with the martial arts, to practice you know, competitions and not and seminars. And there's something there for everyone, as you certainly know, as all of our listeners certainly know. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I, like I said before, maybe all you want to do is uh, improve your health uh, because maybe uh, you, you're, you're of advanced age and you want to take some Tai Chi classes. Or like you say, you want to become an MMA champion. Uh, there is something for everyone. And, and we need to respect uh, as long as the, the motives and, and the intentions and the actions of the person uh, are, are proper, uh, then we cannot criticize which aspect they uh, choose to pursue in the martial arts. Um, and, you know, as long as a person acts in a, in a proper manner, in an ethical manner, um, we 
we cannot judge why they take martial arts or which style they prefer or which, uh, uh, which aspect of the martial arts uh, they want to engage. Uh, it's up to them. It's up to the individual. Uh, it's the character that counts and uh, how the person uh, basically uh, conduct himself or herself uh, in 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 the conduct of, uh, of of their activity. You know that that's the only thing that really counts. I agree. Now, if we go back and we we make a long list of all the people that you've had the opportunity to train with, I mean, some amazing names that you've already just given us. But if we take a look at those names and we we put them aside and we take all the wonderful martial artists left that you haven't trained with. Who would you want to train with? And, and let's even it open up to people that have passed on. Well, the first thing that comes to mind to probably every single martial artist on the planet is probably Bruce Lee. And uh, it is uh, really strange that I was in California in the uh, uh, late 60s and early 70s. And I, uh, I might have had an opportunity to stop by at the school in Chinatown, but I never did. And, uh, you know, it, it could have been uh, that, that incredible, mo magical moment in my life. Um, but it never happened. Uh, the other one that comes to mind uh, is um, Grandmaster Ed Parker. Um, I read so much about him. I, um, I saw him in films and, and other documentaries and stuff. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for who he was and the style that he was teaching, um, a phenomenal martial artist. So I would have loved to have met him, and uh, even, even briefly for a seminar or something, it would have been fantastic for me. Um, there are probably others, uh, but, you know, it, I don't want to disrespect anybody in a sense by omitting, uh, but those two truly come to mind as uh, being uh, people that I would have, absolutely love to have met. And those are great names. And Ed Parker is one that doesn't get named on this show very often, which has always surprised me. Really? Um, uh, it, it, yeah. It, it's incredible because um, I am good friends with um, uh, Grandmaster Jeff Spickman. As you know, he was a student uh, of Ed Parker and become a fairly successful actor also with some you know, good action movies to his credit. And and we talked about that, too, and how um, Campo has, you know, branched out in many different styles, like many other martial arts. But um, uh, I think that we need to give more credit to, uh, to uh, Ed Parker for uh, basically uh, popularizing um, the, the system and, and really creating a, a great, a great group of phenomenal martial artists. And uh, he, he was a, a really wonderful human being, and he needs, to, he needs to get more credit. I agree with you. Yeah, and it might take us um, putting together an episode on him. Sometimes we do some features on martial arts actors or, or other subjects of prominence in the martial arts. So maybe we'll do one on Ed Parker, and we can tell everybody how great he was because he certainly was great yeah now you mentioned a couple i mean actually you mentioned three people that have been in movies and have some notoriety for movies are you at all a fan of, of martial arts film absolutely even the the absolutely horrible ones of the <laughs> uh, of the 1970s where the voice never matches the uh the face and and people flying up in the air and do uh, seven uh, somersaults. Um, they were ridiculous. Do um, you remember uh, Kung Fu uh, movies of Sunday afternoon and TV? I mean, they were phenomenal. They were so ridiculous, and yet we loved them. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, yes, but i got to tell you something. Um, there has been also some very good martial arts movies. Not all of them were, you know, kind of ridiculous. And uh, if you look at some of the um, stuff that Bruce Lee did, obviously, that comes to mind. Uh, they were a great movie. They, and, and to me, actually, the greatest martial arts movie of all time, I have to tell you, uh, was the Karate Kid, the very first Karate Kid movie. 
I think, changed the way Americans looked at the martial arts. And um, it was so inspirational. And at that time, I tell you, I had the school in Florida. And right after the movie came out, the phone did not stop ringing. Um, so many parents, uh, they actually saw something different. They probably thought the martial arts was violent. It was about fighting and beating each other up. All of a sudden, they saw something with a lot of moral and ethical lessons. And they, I, I think the character, um, Miyagi, of course, in the movie, uh, it, it was so such an inspirational character that really made a lot of people see martial arts in a totally different light. So that was my favorite of all time, but there's been many others. Um, you know, Enter the Dragon, of course, was probably the best martial arts movie ever made. And uh, there are many others. Yes, I am, <clears throat> excuse me, I am a fan. Um, I am a fan of martial arts movie. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Yeah, they're, you know, just like with martial arts styles, they all seem to have value well almost all of them i mean I've, I've seen some that are pretty bad that i wouldn't watch again but there's usually at least a couple good moments in there that make it worth your time we just did a few weeks ago a whole episode talking about the karate kid and digging into some of the the pieces of that movie that most people don't know it did a lot of research for it and that that's a lot of fun if people want to want to go check that out but did you know about fumio demora's involvement in that movie No, I was not aware, uh, uh, but I, I recently um, uh, read about it, and uh, I, I met uh, uh, Professor Demura uh, a couple of times. He's a phenomenal martial artist, obviously, um, and I also had the pleasure of meeting uh, Pat Morita, the, the actor, uh, in, in the movie, and it's, it's amazing, most people don't know, that Pat never did martial arts <laughs> and uh and but he did such a great job in the movie and and now we finally found out why yeah yeah there's there's some some fun stuff and i'll I'll share this bit with you um as i was doing the research the piece that stuck out with me the most was if you remember in that movie the scene where miyagi is fighting on Halloween with all the, the, the boys yes. wearing the skeleton costumes. Yes. They had to keep restarting that scene. They had to keep filming it through a, a lot of takes because Demora was hitting them so hard that it was throwing them all off, that they couldn't continue. They would get out of place or something. And they, they complained to the director that he was hitting them too hard. And of course, anyone who knows anything about Fumio Demora knows that he's not going to cheapen what he's doing. He's going to make it as real as he can. Of course. And so he told the director, if you let me put my students in the costumes, we will get it right in the first try. And so they gave it a shot, and they did. First take. They got, they got that scene right with his students. Excellent. So I, that, that's a, I, I thought that was fun. Yeah, that's an interesting story. I, I, I was not aware of it. But that was a phenomenal scene because... Um, when he comes over the uh, the wall uh, to to protect uh, 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 what's his name uh, <laughs> Rob, Dan, Dan. yeah Daniel's son right to protect him and and the the fight scene is excellent it's absolutely realistic and excellent without going overboard I mean and and I I I think the movie was just absolutely the greatest. If it's not my favorite, it's definitely in my top three. I have a hard time picking favorites because it, it, it changes depending on my mood and how I'm feeling and where I'm at with my training at, at that point. Oh, it, you're absolutely right about that, too. But, you know, you look at some of the movies today with, um, let's go with uh, Jet Li um, and uh, certainly with the, some of the modern uh, actors, uh, Jackie Chan and others come to mind. I mean, the movies are so much better in quality and the special effects and the, uh, and the stunts and everything. They're getting better and better. 
However, I would like to express my opinion. The the moral messages uh, that the we got from the other movies, maybe from the 1980s, and I, I think that um, uh, they cannot be forgotten. We 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 may have better technology, but uh, the the message uh, of the Karate Kid, for instance, and a few others, uh, really are, in my opinion, timeless. I think the best movies tell a story. You can't shortchange storytelling for the sake of computer graphics. I agree. Yeah. So of those movies that we talked about, or maybe some others, is there a particular martial arts actor that you like the most? Uh, oh, well, I'm actually friends with some of them with the, like I said, Jeff Speakman, Cynthia Rothrock. So, um, I like them all, and you know, if you look at uh, comedy and acrobatics, I think uh, no one can even come close to Jackie Chan. Uh, the entertainment value of uh, his uh, his movies—they uh, are funny, and the, the kind of improvised weapons and the fight scenes are just incredible. So I, I would say he's one of my favorite, um, but. Not because of who he is, but what he what he puts on the screen. You know, I, I never met Jackie Chan, so I don't know his personality or his character. I just can tell you that, you know, from an entertainment value, is phenomenal. Uh, I think Jet Li is an incredible martial artist. Uh, very realistic, very uh, serious uh, martial artist. Um, and, and there are others, you know, uh, there is recently there has been a series of movie, uh, movies with um, portraying the life of uh, Yip Man, uh, which, uh, of course, was the uh, Bruce Lee's teacher. Um, I don't remember the name of the actor, but it, it, the, 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 the guy is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so um, I have many favorite ones, and probably not one in particular. I like many of them. I think the one you meant at the end was Donnie Yen. Yes, that's the name. Yeah. And I think he's a fantastic actor, and I hope he continues to do movies uh, because he portrays the martial arts in a very, very positive and inspirational way. I, I really like him. He's one of my favorites, too, and he's just he's so incredible. And there are quite a few projects he's working on, at least at the moment, uh, great. based on, on what I've seen. So I think we've got at least a few more movies with him. Great, great. I look forward. Now, how about books? Are you at all a reader? Yes, sir. Um, I, I'm a <laughs> avid reader, and probably <laughs> I read uh, 80% of the martial arts books on the market. Um, I, I used to buy them back in the 70s. Actually, there was a company called Unique Publications. And then, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a Black Belt Publication and other, that, um, O'Hare, that, that was the other company. And they were, you know, putting out books on the martial arts uh, by, by the dozen. And uh, I used to be a little bit... Uh, um, of a maniac, you know, buying every one of them and, and reading every one of them. Um, and uh, up to this day, when some new martial art book could come around uh, and it's a good book or I know the author or I'm interested in the style or the subject or whatever, I, I will go ahead and buy them and read them. Um, I have three books uh, myself on the market, my own books, and uh, one was uh, done by Black Belt Magazine, and it's an excellent book. It's been a bestseller for a while. So I enjoy both reading and uh, writing books. Uh, um, I, that's one of my passions, actually. What are the names of the three books that you've written? So if folks are interested, they can check them out. Oh, uh, okay. Well, the one published by Black, Black Belt Magazine uh, is called uh, uh, Combat Kido, The Art of the Modern Warrior. And it's available, I think, even on Amazon and everywhere. 
then there is one published by Budo International in Europe, and it's called the Combat Hapkido Intelligent Self-Defense. And then there is one that we self-publish called uh, uh, Legacy, uh, The Journey of a Martial Arts Pioneer. And it's basically a biography that uh, my wife uh, put together. Uh, and uh, it, it's a really great book, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pictures of uh, all kinds of martial artists from all over the world. So it's a very interesting book, too. Uh, it's not a book about techniques. Um, so it, it, if you're going to ask me what's my favorite martial arts book of all times, I can tell you because, again, it's probably the same for uh, 80% of martial artists, and it's the Tao of Jeet Kune Do by Bruce Lee. Uh, I think the book is fantastic, uh, full of insight, full of... Uh, not just technical knowledge, but also full of wisdom. And uh, it is amazing that such a young man could write something so profound and uh, so interesting. Uh, it just amazes me. Yeah, it's an incredible book. And you're right, it's one that gets referenced quite a bit on our show. And for listeners, we're going to have links to those three books that Grandmaster Pellegrini has written over on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anyone that might be new to the show. So you can you can check that out and thank you. buy the books and support Grandmaster Pellegrini and do that. Maybe he'll write a fourth book. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So you can write a fourth book. <laughs> so I know that you're, you're traveling and you're, you're giving seminars and Yes. talking to people like us from time to time. But what else are you up to? Do you have any anything that you're working towards? I'm sure you're still training. But do you have any goals for the future? Well, I think that a good martial artist should always have goals for the future. Um, you know, we stop learning the day that we die. That is my philosophy. You never stop learning. And you also should never stop contributing to the field, to the endeavor that you have chosen, regardless of what it is, music, uh, any, any kind of human endeavor. If you become part of it, if you become a prominent figure, you should continue to contribute. You should continue to produce. Never really rest on your laurels and say, okay, you know, I've reached the top. I have accomplished everything I want to accomplish. I'm done. There is no such a thing. Uh, I start new projects all the time. I think of new products that I want to develop, meaning, you know, mostly uh, uh, educational products like DVDs and books. Uh, I'm in the process of writing another book, and my wife uh, is helping me with that. And uh, one of the things that I uh, realized is that she's been by my side all these years building my organization and our business, we are in 20 countries around the world with about 200 affiliate schools. Um, you know, we do seminars all over the world. And uh, I realized that she has always taken the backstage in this. And now uh, we have uh, started a new project where she's going to start doing seminars on her own. And she has developed a whole program uh, of uh, women's self-defense uh, that goes beyond just the techniques, but is also very motivational for women that have been abused, women that have suffered trauma, and women that have been, you know, in, in let's say, treated with, uh, exposed to violence and other unpleasant situations. So she's doing a lot of work that that's now um, her way of giving back and and starting something new and to contribute to the uh, to the industry um so we working on that project uh i continue traveling the world and doing seminars too and promoting our system um we have a couple of new dvds uh, that we are working on uh so we we got some stuff that we will release in the next uh you know couple of years and we're working on projects but um I'll tell you, um, it's it's never uh, it's never over. 
the way I look at life is that as long as I have a breath in me, I will continue um, doing what I do. Um, I, I always look at life as if, you know, uh, I have many, many more years ahead of me to make a contribution. Um, I don't want to stop. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I feel that it's a little bit like it's my mission. It's my responsibility because I've been so fortunate. Uh, to give back and to continue reaching out to as many people as possible. And we're all very fortunate that you feel that way. Thank you, certainly. I haven't had the opportunity to take one of your seminars yet, but it is on my short list. And to that end, if someone wants to find out where you're teaching or if they want to schedule you to bring you in for a seminar, how would they go about get a, getting a hold of you? Well, we have a, a website, a quite extensive uh, website, uh, a, which has, uh, by the way, a, a button that you can click on seminars. And I am booked, and my wife do basically a year in advance, so they can so they can see now um, where I'm going to be seven, eight, nine, ten months from now. And all they have to do is click on it, and they are open to everyone, not just people of our system. Everyone is welcome, including non-martial artists. We, we make them feel comfortable if they are not into the martial arts, um, because we do most of our seminars without wearing a martial arts uniform, and we, uh, we build them in mostly a self-defense. Of course, they are about our system, called the Hapkido, but um, we... Uh, we, we welcome everyone, different styles, uh, dif uh, all ages, men and women, and uh, they can come and have a good time and learn about our system. So uh, that's the place. The website is called uh, www.dsihq.com. DSI is our, um, <laughs> it, it's our corporate entity, it means uh, Defense Services International, DSI, HQ, Headquarter. Um, so, but this style is Combat Hapkido. We also have a store online called www.combathapkido.com, and people can go there and, and buy things and uh, look at our products, our DVDs, our, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff. So we are very active in the martial arts community. Uh, we are very active in events. Uh, we attend the uh, Hall of Fame events, uh, and we you know so we are we are very active, and uh, we want to continue reaching out to people. Great, great, and I, I hope you continue to do that. I know that I've I've heard so many positive things about Combat Hop Keto and, and your contributions. Well, and, thank you. Um, you know, really, really looking forward to connecting with you at some point and, and learning from you directly. But as we wind down the show here, we always like to part on the highest of notes. If you had some final words of advice for the people that are listening, what would you tell them? Well, what I would tell martial artists is never give up. Basically, that is. Uh, in life, there are adversity. We have periods of good economy and bad economy. We have times of trouble with terrorism and with uh, crime and riots and stuff like that. It happens that in our lives, we have health and we have sickness. We have good times and we have bad times. If there is one lesson to be taken from the martial artist, uh, it is never give up. There is always tomorrow. We have to show strength, not just physical, but spiritual and mental. We have to be strong and never give up, even in the face of adversity. And to non-martial artists, my words of wisdom would be, what are you waiting for? Join us. Become a martial artist. It will make it for a better and a safer society. Um, there is nothing negative about what we do. It's all positive, both the self-defense aspect, the emotional, the character building, the respect that we show, the contributions that we make to society. It's all positive. There is, there is, there is nothing bad about it. So 
Uh, I would like to see, uh, instead of 3% of the population doing martial arts, I would like to see 95% of the population doing martial arts. But um, that is really what I would like to say to people. Don't give up. Thank you for listening to Episode 72 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Grandmaster Pellegrini. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes, including an introductory video to Combat Hapkido, links to the books he's written, and so much more. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our custom apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. Pretty much everywhere you might think of. And our username is always Whistlecake. And remember the products you can find at whistlecake.com, like our comfortable, durable, and protective shin guards, much better than a bruised tibia. Stay tuned for a bit more from Grandmaster Pellegrini, but that's all from us today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Uh, one little thing I want to say, too many grandmasters, quote-unquote, have lost the ability to laugh at themselves. And they wind yes. up taking themselves a little bit too seriously. And we need to remember who we are. We are human. And, you know, just because we have a title... Just because we have a, a rank, that doesn't make us any special. We just achieve a certain level of expertise in a particular field. But other than that, we're just like everybody else. And we need to learn how to laugh at ourselves and uh, how to not take ourselves too seriously. <laughs>